Hello guys and welcome to one more Blade Ride. Today I'm going to show you how to play Partition. Partition is a two-player campaign tournament system consisting of three games, all based on popular esports gaming genres. First-person shooters, multiplayer online battle arenas, and collectible card games. Each game can be played without owning the other games, but if you do own all of them, then you can combine them together and with the Partition Core Box and play the Partition Grand Tournament, which is a three-match contest to decide once and for all who can build the best team of gamers and lead them to victory. Let's start with the first game, Incursion Point Zero. Incursion Point Zero is Partition's first-person shooter-inspired game where two military factions vie for control of a nuclear missile. One player controls the strike team, who must retake their base from the terrorists, searching for the missile one location at a time. The other player controls the terrorists, hiding their soldiers, the missile and other resources and waiting for the perfect moment to strike. Players build the map together, drawing a hand of locations and then taking turns placing them to form the battlefield they will soon be fighting on. But let's take things from the beginning. First, each player selects four gamers from the gamer deck. To set up the game, the player controlling the strike team is the attacking player and takes the strike team soldier cards, while the other player is the defending player and takes the terrorist soldier cards as well as the incursion cards that allow them to hide in various locations. Each soldier card includes their skills and focus and a corresponding token to use as they move around the map. Each player selects any four soldiers and attaches them to their gamer cards. Then, they each place the combined cards in a row in front of them, determining the soldier's activation order from left to right. Each of them has unique stats and abilities. For example, this one, when attacking with this soldier, this indicates that his focus is dexterity and has a stat of 5. The other stats stand for Wisdom, Awareness, Strategy and X-Factor. This is the maximum range in locations he can attack, his hit points and the default damage this soldier inflicts when attacking. There is also a talent written for each over here which refers to unique abilities as do the skills as well. For the ones that happen only once per match you need to place a cooldown token on it to mark it has been used. To build the map, you shuffle the location deck, the strike team draws 6 cards and the terrorists 7. The map when finished should contain 4 rows or zones with no more than 5 cards each. Players take turns placing locations, beginning with the strike team, who needs to place on the bottom right corner of the map, and that row will be zone 1 and no other location can be placed lower or further right than this. The terrorist player then places a location adjacent to or diagonally from any already placed location. Players continue to place locations until the strike team runs out of cards and then the terrorist player places the rest of his to complete the map. The locations with the barbed wire icon restrict where the location may be placed. If a location card's restrictions cannot be overcome, like for example needing to place it in a zone that is already full, then that card is discarded and the map will have one less location. The terrorist player then places one incursion card including the missile and the four of his soldiers under each location on the map in secret. A match of incursion point zero takes place over a maximum of six rounds. The game ends immediately if the strike team player secures the location of the nuclear missile while the terrorists win if they manage to have the control of the nuclear missile until the end of the sixth round. Each round consists of each living soldier activating in the order they were set up. When a soldier activates, they may move and then attack. If you choose to attack first, you sacrifice the option of moving. The strike team always activates first in a round. They select the first soldier in line and place his or her token at any location in zone 1. Each soldier may move two locations per activation, including their initial placement. When a strike team soldier enters an unsecure location, which is any location with an unrevealed incursion card or an enemy soldier, they have to end their movement there. 
the terrorist soldiers must also end their movement when entering a location with an enemy soldier. Each location may contain only two soldiers, regardless of faction. Both players have the option to skip one of their soldiers' activation. If a terrorist soldier is at the same location as an unrevealed terrorist soldier and a strike team soldier attempts to move to that location, the terrorist soldier must be revealed and the strike team soldier remains at the current location. If a soldier leaves a location with an enemy soldier, that enemy soldier may make a free attack without any base damage uh, against the departing soldier. If a soldier is not killed, movement continues as normal. When a strike team soldier enters a location with an unrevealed incursion card, they reveal the card. If the card is not an enemy soldier, resolve the text first and the soldier may then attack an enemy soldier in range. If the revealed card is an enemy soldier, that soldier makes a free attack against the strike team without any base damage. You also take out the card and replace it with the according terrorist soldier token. When attacking, you first determine if the target is in range. Count the number of locations, only orthogonally, not diagonally, from your soldier to the enemy soldier without including your current location. If the target is in range, both soldiers will attack each other, assuming the defending soldier has adequate range. To attack, roll as many dice as gamers stat that corresponds with the soldier's focus. In the final version of the game, there will be custom dice with a symbol on three of its sides, when the symbol is rolled is considered a success and each success is added to the base damage. For this video we are going to use six-sided dice and success will be when rolling four, five or six. When attacking you need to place damage tokens on the enemy soldier equal to the damage inflicted. If a soldier has damage tokens equal to or greater than their hit points, the soldier is killed. The enemy soldier may counterattack even if they're killed the free attacks that we mentioned earlier do not elicit a counter-attack and they're usually performed in addition to the soldier's normal attack during their activation. The round continues until all soldiers have activated or passed. At the beginning of rounds 3 to 5, respawns occur. All soldiers from the strike team respawn on rounds 3 and 5, regardless of how many have been killed. And the same holds for the terrorist team in round 4. The strike team player wins by securing the location of the nuclear missile, as in the missile card is revealed and no enemy soldier occupies the location. Otherwise, the terrorist player wins at the end of round 6. Either team can win even if all of their soldiers have been killed, as long as their victory condition has been met. Eventide of Heroes is Partition's multiplayer online battle arena inspired game. Each player holds a team of five heroes, fighting the opposing team over the remains of a shattered world. Your goal is to destroy enough of your opponent's towers to clear a path to their fortress so you may obliterate it. You accomplish this by using a combination of strategy and brute force, outwitting your opponent and striking where they are weakest. Each player needs 5 gamers for a match of even tide of heroes and they must be selected before setup. Each player takes 5 towers and 1 fortress and places them in this configuration. Each player will also need 7 lane cards including 1 card of each class Bruiser, Defender, Provoker, Sorcerer and Wanderer 1 decoy card and 1 minion rush card. Players will begin the game with the 5 class cards and the decoy, so place the minion rush card off to the side for now. You also place the dice and the various tokens within reach and you place a single gold token on one side of the towers to identify which lane is top lane. This one is the middle one and the one furthest from the gold token is bottom lane. The heroes are the avatars the gamers will use to play even tide of heroes. Each player must select one hero from each class and the selection can be either by drafting for each class or through a general consensus. To perform a draft, players roll against each other using their gamer with the highest X factor from the one selected before to determine the number of dice rolled. The winner selects one bruiser and then after that each player selects two, repeating until there are no more bruisers left to select. The player who lost the X-Factor roll 
now selects one defender hero followed by again the other player selecting two using the same pattern until there are no more defenders. This continues with each class in alphabetical order, Bruiser, Defender, Provoker, Sorcerer and Wanderer, until all heroes are drafted. The first player picking is alternating after each class, so the winner of the X-Factor role selected first the Bruiser, the Provoker and the Wanderer, and the other player the other two. Once the draft is over, the players select one hero from each class and assign them to their gamers. Heroes and gamers have many abilities, each with specific requirements for when they can be used. Generally, there are three types of abilities, items and talents. There's the cooldown, which can be used only once per match. You place a cooldown token on the text area when it's been used. The interrupt type are special cooldown abilities a player may activate whenever they feel they need to. There are also the passive types, which are permanent bonuses that are always active and cannot be negated or removed. In Event Tide of Heroes, there are three lanes which heroes may use to attempt to destroy the enemy towers. Heroes are placed in secret using the class cards as proxies to identify which hero is in which lane. Players begin by rolling against each other, using their gamer in the match with the highest X factor to determine the number of dice rolled. The winner may pick who goes first. Each game of Eventide of Heroes is split into two phases, Lane and Assault. Each phase consists of multiple rounds and each round is divided into three stages, Placement, Reveal and Resolve. In the Placement stage, the player activating first takes their five class cards and one decoy card and places any number of these lane cards they want in any one of the three lanes. The other player then places as well any number of their six lane cards in any one of the three lanes. The first player then places cards in another lane and so forth until both players have made their designations for each of the three lanes. There is no passing in this sequence. If a player chooses not to place any lane cards during their turn, they must choose a lane and they will be unable to place cards on that lane this round. The placement stage is followed by the reveal stage and players flip over all of their lane cards displaying the location of their heroes and discarding their decoys. Players then take turns activating their skills and items with the player who first plays their heroes choosing first again. Only one skill or item can be activated before the other player may act. There is no limit to the amount of items or skills a player can activate as long as it's their turn to do so. The first player may choose to pass and they will still be able to take a turn after the other player, but if the second player passes, the reveal stage is over. Then the resolve stage begins with determining if any fortresses or towers were destroyed. You need to compare the number of heroes for each player per lane. If a player's heroes are outnumbered 2 to 1 in a lane, they are overrun and one of their towers in that lane is destroyed. The two inner towers on either side of a team's fortress may be destroyed from any lane if that lane's outer tower is destroyed. But the fortress itself may not be attacked until both inner towers are destroyed. Any player losing one of their inner towers ends the lane phase and moves the game to the Assault phase at the start of the next round. Players are awarded one gold for each tower they destroy. Once each lane is checked for destroyed towers, players will resolve combat in each lane in order, beginning with top lane and ending with bottom lane. The player who placed all their lane cards first performs all of their hero's attacks and then the other player does the same. Combat in each lane occurs simultaneously and heroes killed by the first player are still allowed to attack. To attack, select one of your heroes and one of your opponent's heroes and roll the gamer stat that corresponds to your hero's focus. Each success is added to the attacker's base damage. Place damage tokens on the target hero equal to the amount of damage inflicted. If a hero has damage tokens equal to or greater than their hit points, the hero is killed and you place a respawning token on their hero card. Players receive one gold for each enemy hero they kill. Once all heroes have attacked, resolve the mid lane and then the bottom one. After bottom lane is resolved, remove the lane cards from play and prepare for the next round. During this time, you may spend your gold 
if you have any. You may purchase a hero's item for 2 gold or upgrade an already purchased item for 3 gold. If any of your heroes have a respawning token, they will be unavailable this round. Play continues in the lane phase until an inner tower is destroyed. Once that happens, the assault phase begins. The assault phase is very similar to the lane phase, except players use an additional lane card, the minion rush. This card does not attack, but acts as a hero for the purposes of determining if a lane is overrun. When starting the assault phase, don't forget to remove cooldown tokens from all once per phase abilities. To win, you need to destroy your opponent's fortress, but there is a rare possibility that both players will destroy each other's fortress on the same round. If that happens, the player who destroys their opponent's fortress from the highest lane wins, with descending order being top, mid, bottom. Tech Hand is inspired by collectible card games and is a quick and strategic combat game for two players. Each player controls a captain and their crew on the crammed 3 by 3 quarters of two docked starships. You must kill your opponent's captain while protecting your own, using the unique strengths and abilities of your crew. Each player needs one gamer for a match of deck hand. To set up, take the three airlock cards and place them across the center of the table to create the map. Each player chooses a captain and a 20 card deck and places their captain below the rightmost airlock card, each player from their perspective. Each player then shuffles their decks and draws 5 cards. If a player is unhappy with their initial hand, they may return the cards, shuffle the deck again and draw 5 new cards. But this new hand is final. You also place your gamer, the dice and the token close to the map. There are 3 types of cards in the deck hand deck. Captains, crew and maneuvers. In the cards, here is the symbol which shows to which captain the card belongs to. This number is the cost of Korites to summon the crew or activate the maneuver. Captains do not have a cost, instead in this space you can see their symbols. Again, like in the previous games, we have range, base damage and hit points. The range indicates how many compartments away the captain or crew can attack. If a card doesn't have any of these, then it's a maneuver. There is also a special ability and for the captains only a skill, which is similar to the special ability but costs one Korite to activate. Deckhand is played on a map divided into three zones, each made up of three compartments. The center zone's compartments are marked by the three airlock cards and on either side of it is a starship zone. Players begin by rolling their gamer's X-Factor stat. The player who rolls the most symbols or successes activates first. The first player draws a card and has two Korite to spend on summoning crew, activating maneuvers or their captain skill. The other players, in every turn after the first, each player who draws a card has three Korite to spend. During their turn, players may move and attack with their captain or any crew already on board for free. Spending Korite and activating your captain or crew can be performed in any order, but each card must be resolved completely before moving on to the next. So for example, after having moved your captain, you need to attack with him before using a maneuver. Each crew and captain may only activate once per turn. Captains and crew may move one compartment away from their current location each turn. Movement may occur before or after attacking and generally may not be performed diagonally unless otherwise indicated on the card. To summon a crew member, you pay the cost indicated and you place the crew on one of the three compartments in your starship zone. The crew may move one compartment after being summoned, but they may not attack until next turn. A crew or captain may attack an enemy if the target is within the crew or captain's range and is not blocked by any other enemy. For a range greater than one, Count the compartments to confirm that the target is within range and then use the center of the attacker's compartment to make a straight line to the target's compartment. If the line does not cross another enemy crew or captain, then the attack can take place. Roll as many dice as the value of your gamer's wisdom. Each symbol roll is considered a success in the final game. For this video, it's 4, 5 and 6 and each success is added to the attacker's base damage. So you place damage tokens to the target equal to the amount of damage inflicted. If the target survives, they may perform a counter-attack. 
if their attacker is in range. You roll dice just like a normal attack, but use the value of your gamer's X Factor instead. One important thing to note is that captains cannot attack one another directly. If a crew has damage tokens equal to or greater than their hit points, it is killed and becomes a corpse. By the way, when moving to a compartment with a corpse, destroys the corpse and you move the card to the corresponding discard pile. If a captain has damage tokens equal to or greater than their hit points, the captain is killed and the opposing player wins the game. If each compartment in your starship zone is occupied and at least one compartment contains an enemy crew or captain, you may perform a reckless charge to create room. Pay the correct cost to summon a crew on one of your starship compartments occupied by an enemy. Move the enemy into the adjacent airlock compartment and move any crew or captain already in the airlock compartment to the adjacent enemy starship compartment. If the last compartment in the column is also occupied by a crew, move that crew to the owning player's discard pile. If it's occupied by a captain, the captain takes 3 damage and the crew that was in the airlock compartment at the start of the reckless charge is discarded instead. The Partition Grand Tournament is the triathlon of the esports competition as it takes all the three partition games and transforms them into an exciting tournament experience. You'll start from scratch, building your humble esports team from a pair of gamers and some cash. You and your opponent will play the three partition games in order, earning cash prizes and overcoming varied events on your path to the ultimate victory. Partition games are divided into three classes based on the number of gamers needed by each player to compete. Each partition campaign consists of three matches and uh, the games used need to be in order of class. The order is important as otherwise teams may not have enough gamers to compete. With the existing games of partition it's advised to start with deck hand continue with Incursion Point Zero and finish with Eventide of Heroes. You start the setup by shuffling the event and gamer gear decks and place them near both players. Combine all gamers from all partition games, setting aside the gamer guy and gamer gal cards for now. You separate the rest of the gamers into small decks based on salary and shuffle them. Each player draws two gamers, from the 50k deck and receives 150k in starting cash tokens. You then draw two gamers from each gamer deck and place them in front of the decks and four cards from the gamer gear deck. Let's take a look at the different cards of the game. The event cards have an icon at the top left corner. It can be a calendar for events or a mouse for gamer gear. The gamer gear cards have purely the mouse icon. Here's the cost for buying this gear and there's also a boost that can be passive or have a once per match effect. And there are also the gamer cards which we have seen before. Each of the three matches is divided into two phases team building and tournament. During the team building, players will take turns drawing event cards, purchasing gamers and gear, and generally preparing for the next match. In the tournament phase, players will play one of the partition games, and then they will collect prize money based on the result. Let's have a look at the team building phase. Before the first match, players roll dice equal to the gamer's highest X-Factor stat. The player with the highest number of successes rolled draws a card from the event deck and resolves it. Events may add or subtract from your total cash, offer free gamer gear or have unique effects on the next match or tournament. The second player draws and resolves an event card as well. After resolving their events, players take turns in purchasing new gamers and gear. The player who won the X Factor role may purchase first. When a gamer or gamer gear card is purchased, replace it immediately with another card from the deck. After the first player makes a purchase, the second player can make one too and purchases continue until one player passes. Then the remaining player can make one final purchase and then the tournament phase begins. Gamer gear can be traded freely among your gamers, but only one piece of gamer gear can be equipped per gamer at a time. In the team building phase, you will have to deal with the dilemma of choosing a gamer that is good for you now or a more balanced gamer that will still be useful in the later games. The money is tight, so these decisions are crucial 
as well as to how much of gamer gear to purchase. Going to the tournament, you clear the table to make space for the first partition game. You only keep the event deck as is and you reshuffle all the other decks. If a player does not have enough gamers to play the game, they may use the gamer guy or gamer gal. If they still don't have enough gamers, they forfeit the tournament. Once each tournament is over, players collect their prize money according to whether they came first or second and according to which tournament they just played. Then any events in play are discarded. You collect all of the unpurchased gamers and gamer gear and reshuffle the decks and set up the same way as previously. The winner of the third tournament is the winner of the Partition Grand Tournament. And that was Partition. Thank you guys for watching and I hope you enjoy the game.